what knowledge skills and attitude must they acquire and what capabilities do they need to develop in order to become effective teachers the answer to these question is competent planning and delivery of instruction teachers have to arrange instructional events for students in such a way that optimal and appropriate learning is facilitated these events must be carefully designed in advance if effective learning is to be facilitated so and you can say a uh, convenient presentation and organization of instructional events and are therefore essential for successful instruction so today our session is about planning and delivering effective instruction and we will learn in this session first of all the instructional planning that is uh, what we mean by instructional planning and why planning is essential for a teacher so what and why of planning then we will focus on determining what to teach and planning how to teach after having understood the instruction planning we will move to instructional delivery wherein we will focus on three phases of a presentation one is introduction second is development and third is consolidation and during these three phases the focus will be on explanation demonstration questioning assigning tasks and motivation reinforcement so let us first of all learn the concept of instructional planning so before we explain the concept of instruction planning i think it is very essential to understand these two terms separately one is instruction and second is planning uh before uh, coming to the definition of instruction i think it is very essential to understand the difference between two terms that is teaching and instruction actually teachers have been using these two terms interchangeably but actually the meaning of these two terms is different uh you see uh, instruction can be facilitated through media through a uh, book or through some slides but in case students have certain doubts they cannot seek further information further elaboration or further you can say uh, information whereas teaching involves face to face interaction between the teacher and the students and whenever they find any doubt they can go for further clarification information so both aim at achieving certain objective but it is the manner or the procedure by which these objectives are achieved makes these two terms different now coming to the planning part planning refers to plan of actions of what a person has to do or what a person has to act so when it comes to instructional planning it means plan of actions of what a teacher has to perform in the classroom 
actually the instruction planning is a teaching outline of important points of a lesson arranged in the order in which they are to be presented it may include objectives to be achieved points to be made question to be asked reference to media reference to uh, assignment or reference to some books so we can say that it is an organized statement of general and specific goals together with the specific means by which these goals are to be attained by the learners under the guidance of a teacher on a given day so it's a sort of daily lesson planning so daily lesson planning involves defining instructional objectives selecting and arranging content matter and determining the methods and procedure now we will move to what instructional planning means planning this instructional planning attempts to answer three questions first is where am i going of course in the lesson it means what the student will be able to do at the end of a unit of instruction it means what are the instruction objectives so this question is a uh, 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 is considered at the time of preparation of a plan second is how will i get there that is what method what media what evaluation procedure uh, the teacher will employ in reaching at the conclusion or in reach, uh, in achieving the objectives and the third is how will i know when i have arrived that is uh, during uh, the explanation as well as at the end of the session teacher may ask few question that will give him feedback to what extent his uh, session has been successful so lesson planning attempts to answer these three questions now a very important aspect why there is a need to prepare a lesson plan uh, the obvious uh, answer is that a uh, lesson plan ensures presentation of content matter in a logical systematic and effective way keeping in mind at the same time the mental development of students for whom we plan to teach so we proceed from simple to difficult we proceed from concrete to abstract we proceed from known to unknown or we proceed from observation to reasoning so the content matter is arranged in a sequence and in a logical manner it enables the teacher to achieve the economy of time effort and even money why how you see teacher has prepared the lesson plan so it checks have other way of teaching it keeps the teacher on track so the lesson will be conducted in a smooth manner so lot of time will be saved uh, effort will be also saved uh, uh, in regard to time say the teacher has borrowed some media from other agency and he has not properly integrated in teaching learning then the money part will also go waste because the media has not been properly utilized and the advantage is that it develops self confidence in the teacher because he knows in advance what to do and what not to do so it gives him confidence and he knows uh, beforehand how to handle with the problems and how to respond to the students question that they that they ask during the classroom presentation another advantage of making a plan is that it ensures proper utilization of instructional media in the classroom that is you will use media only when the need arises and you will remove when there is no need so it uh, ensures effective utilization of instructional media it ensures linkages of the past knowledge of the learner with the new knowledge by employing the principles of correlation and integration that is a uh, uh, planning of instruction will help the teacher to link what he is telling with what the students already know or with their daily life experiences another advantage is that he can evaluate his work as the lesson proceeds and thus reveals teacher's personality so when the teacher is uh, presenting a lecture he knows uh, about the uh, facial reading of the students he knows to what extent his ideas are getting across so that feedback uh, will be very helpful for a teacher to incorporate certain changes uh, for the future lectures now let us uh, 
come to the components of instructional planning. So the first component is specifying instructional objectives. Now the question is, what is an objective? In very simple language, objective is a sentence or a statement which describes what the student will be able to do at the end of a unit of instruction. So as a teacher, first of all, our duty is to specify instructional objectives and these objectives need to be written uh, in general and specific ways. So the detail we will take up later. The second is that he has to select content matter. So the teacher chooses the content matter once he has considered the curriculum requirements, the student's needs and the time allocated for the particular topic. The next component is carrying out task analysis. That is, uh, the teacher analyzes a task. A task could be any topic like Ohm's law, like solving simultaneous equation. The task could be a job in a, uh, in a workshop, like setting up a lathe or fitting a film in a camera, or it is a skill. So, task analysis breaks down the topic into smaller and detailed constituent units and then the teacher sequences these units of analysis in order of priority based upon their importance in learning. So we will study uh, uh, in detail after some time. The next decision he has to make is about selection of instructional method. What are instructional method? Actually, instructional methods aim at establishing a link between teaching input and learning outcomes, mainly in terms of realizing learning outcomes. And a large number of methods have been devised from time to time to make teaching learning very effective. Uh, each method has its own advantages and disadvantages, and it will be incorrect to use a single method which can be employed for teaching of various topics in polytechnics and engineering colleges. So there are methods which are useful only in large groups like lecture, demonstration. However, demonstration can be given to a smaller group. It can also be given to an individual student. There are methods which are useful only in small groups like seminar, group discussion, brainstorming, panel discussion, project work. Likewise, there are methods which provide individualized instruction like computer assisted instruction or self learning module. So you will see that there are some objectives which can be best achieved by following one particular method. Likewise, there are some students who can be taught very effectively by following another method of instruction. So teacher has to uh, decide about the instructional method keeping in mind the nature of the topic, the characteristics of the learner, and the availability of other resource materials. Another decision the teacher has to make about is the selection and development of instructional media. Instructional media refer to both print and non-print for conveying instructional stimuli and content. So, uh, selection and development of instructional media should take into account few factors like nature of the subject, the learner's characteristics, the size of the class, the mode of imparting instruction, budgetary provisions, as well as the practical factors including teacher's capability for, uh, for uh, facilitating better learning in the class. The next task of the teacher is to decide about the evaluation procedure. By evaluation, we mean those activities which are designed to measure student achievement brought about as a result of a unit of instruction. So the performance objective or the instruction objective is the keystone in planning of evaluation procedure. So we will see what kind of uh, evaluation techniques can be employed for, uh, for uh, developing the lecture. And at the end, the format of a lesson plan. Now we'll move to 
first component that is the instructional objective as i told you in the beginning it is a sentence or a statement which describes what the student will be able to do at the end of a unit of instruction and these can be written as general in general way as well as in specific way for example the topic is ohms law now for this topic the general objective is after the topic is over student will be able to understand ohms law so understand is very global and the specific objectives are he will be able to define current he will be able to define voltage resistance he will be able to draw the circuit diagram of ohms law he will be able to state ohms law he will be able to verify ohms law he will be able to draw graph between v and i so i have used few words like define state draw derive so all these are specific objective so these lead to the attainment of general objective that is they will be able to understand ohms law after the topic is over so instruction objectives basically serve three purposes these help the teacher to define what must be learned what capabilities should be uh, built in the students the second is are uh, the uh, these give sufficient guidance to the teacher as to what instructional methods and media should be employed to reach the desired learning level and the third sir uh, purpose is that these are of a uh, considerable assistance in planning assessment procedure general aim of education and particular aim of technical education is harmonious development of learners so developing students harmoniously means developing their capabilities in intellect and non intellect areas and these areas are concerned with knowledge skills and attitude so knowledge skills and attitude knowledge means what someone need to know in order to do a job that is theory skill means what does someone need to be able to do that is skill and third is what sort of approach to his work does that person doing that job need to have attitude so these three areas are called as domains and different people have given different nomenclature so knowledge is cognitive domain skill refers to psychomotor cognitive that is mind so knowledge psycho psycho means brain or mind motor means muscle so skills involve hand and head coordination and third one is attitude it is the affective domain which is concerned with our attitude with our feelings with our uh, interest values emotions etc the uh, taxonomy has been given by bloom as per uh, bloom's taxonomy cognitive domain refers to intellectual outcomes namely knowledge understanding and problem solving and this particular domain has various levels at the lowest level is the remembering next in the hierarchy is the understanding application analysis evaluation and creation under affective domain the various levels are receiving responding valuing organizing and characterization and affective domain refers to attitudes interest values feelings and emotions the third domain is psychomotor which refers to motor skills development which may include hand and head coordination and it has got various levels like imitation manipulation precision articulation and naturalization 
Now, in this particular session, we will be uh, focusing on the cognitive domain and its various levels. The first level that is at the lowest level is the remembering. Remembering means recalling or you can say uh, reproducing. So, remembering of uh, basic facts well, like water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, yeah. SI unit of force is Newton. So, no understanding is required. So, the behavioral terms which can be used for writing instruction objectives include choose, cite, enumerate, label, list, match, name and so on. Uh, example could be name one sulfide ore of copper. When I say name one sulfide of copper, he, it means he is to simply reproduce, he is to simply recall of recalling the previously remembered material or when I say state SI unit of force. So, all these require a lowest level of knowledge. Next in the hierarchy is the understanding which refers to explaining ideas or concepts. That is the student will be able to grasp the meaning of information by interpreting and by translating and the behavioral terms used uh, in this category include classify, convert, define, describe, estimate and so on. So, uh, the example could be define force. The example could be explain the working principle of carburetor of an IC engine. So, he is to explain and so on. So, these are the uh, these behavioral terms are also called as action verbs because these behaviors can be observed these behaviors can be measured very easily in as compared to uh, the word understand, the word know. So, these cannot be uh, measured very easily, these cannot be observed very easily. That is why the word know and understand are used for describing general objectives and these are the specific objectives. Next in the hierarchy is the student's ability to apply classroom learning in a new situation that is for problem solving in everyday life. So, the behavioral terms can be included adapt, apply, calculate, change, compute, construct, demonstrate, draw, exhibit, show, generalize, interpret etc. So, when I say draw a circle diagram showing uh, some variables. Okay, So, he has to apply on the basis of what he has learned in a particular topic. The next in the hierarchy is the student's ability to break down something into its constituent parts and then looking into various relationships. So, that is uh, uh, breaking, the, uh, breaking information into parts and the behavioral terms in, uh, included in this category are analyze, appraise, arrange, compare, contrast, detect, discriminate, distinguish, when I say distinguish between a telescope and a microscope uh, on various uh, you can say uh, parameters or when I say uh, when I say uh, uh, write down various factors responsible for air pollution. So, these can be uh, included under analysis category. The next in the category is the evaluation, again critical thinking, justifying a decision or course of action and the behavioral terms included in this category are to appraise, assess, choose, compare, conclude, decide and so on. So, these uh, verbs can be used for writing the instruction objective as well as for measuring the students attainment of these objectives in the form of a question. And in the next uh, is the creation, uh, generating new idea, product or ways of viewing things and the uh, behavioral terms included in this category include act, assemble, blend, compose, construct, create, design, develop and so on. So, after having understood the cognitive domain and its various levels and the behavioral terms for writing. Uh, uh, the instruction objective. Now, we will come to the task analysis. As I uh, 
told you in the beginning that task analysis is a process of breaking down or analyzing a task into smaller and more detailed constituent units and of then sequencing these units of analysis in order of priority based upon their importance in learning. So in simple language, I will say that it breaks down the complexity of an activity into easier steps. These steps are then arranged in a sequence and students are taught each step in a sequence. So task analysis involves two activities. One is analysis, second is synthesis. Because when you are uh, breaking something into its constituent parts, you are looking into various relationships. So when you see the relationship, you will be able to assemble it again. You will be able to synthesize. Now let me explain the process of task analysis with uh, an illustration. Say task is any job, like job of an engine mechanic. Task, could it could be a topic like Ohm's law, solving simultaneous equation, or it could be a skill. Skill is a further extension of job. Now, say uh, the topic is broken down into say sub five themes. So one, two, three, four, five. That is all these five things are required for teaching a task, particular task. Now, at the second level, say these one, two, three, four, five. These five units are required for teaching this particular aspect. Okay. Then, at the third level. Again, we are breaking down the sub parts into sub sub parts. Now, this diagram shows that there are various levels of analysis and each succeeding level produces greater detail than the one before. You see, uh, at the top, the content is less detailed and at the bottom, the content is more detailed. So when we teach in the classroom, we proceed from the bottom and we move to all these components and then we come to the main topic. Let me give you one uh, illustration. Say the topic is or the job is job of an engine mechanic. And uh, the duties could be tuning the carburetor, adjusting tappets, adjust spark plug, changing engine oil and cleaning the spark plug. So I have broken down the job of an engine mechanic into these five, uh, uh, you can say, activities. Now let us analyze one of these activities, say changing engine oil. So what could be the components? Jacking up the car, placing oil container under the sump, removing sump plug, allowing oil to drain away. So for changing engine oil, these five activities he has to perform. Now let us take up uh, another sub part and break down into its constituent parts. So jacking up the car. So you see for jacking up the car, the activities include acquiring right kind of jack, positioning the jack and then manipulating the jack. So when the student is able to acquire right kind of jack, position the jack and manipulate the jack, he is able to jack up the car. Likewise, Every uh, task is to be further broken down into its sub sub task. So this is how task analysis is carried out and it helps the teacher in giving a sequence to his presentation and uh, helps in uh, presenting the instructional event in an eff efficient way. Uh, before we move to instructional delivery, it is very essential to learn the general principles of instructional planning. Acquire a sound knowledge of curriculum requirements and content. Students learn most from those teachers who have a good understanding of the content matter of unit of instruction and relevant curriculum requirements. So as a teacher, we need to uh, go into depth uh, in a particular syllabus, we need to know what are the curriculum requirements, what are the uh, um, requirements of the industry and so on. So this is the first principle. Second is plan instruction on the basis of what 
your students actually know and understand and not on an assumption of what they should have learned in the previous lectures or previous uh, class. Students are disadvantaged by those teachers who presume that they have complete understanding of the content of previous lecture or previous session. So the teacher has to proceed from what they know and move slowly, slowly to what they do not know. This is the basic principle of making a lesson plan. The third principle is always prepare instructional objectives for every topic or for every lesson and these must be communicated to the students when uh, you are going to make a presentation and the objective should be written uh, at two levels the general objective and the specific objective I have given few examples the another principle is select instructional strategies that are appropriate for the topic a proper match between the instructional methods and media with the students needs and curriculum requirement facilitates optimal learning and the principle is plan a beginning a middle and a conclusion for all lessons and beginning must include two things one is review of prerequisites and overview of the lecture uh, never begin wrongly always give them a reason for uh, learning a new topic second is middle middle means the development of your presentation which must include the explanation the demonstration use of chalkboard uh, involving student participation asking question or uh, giving some assignment and so on and the third is the conclusion that is at the end that is before leaving the classroom the teacher is to summarize what he has covered in the uh, lecture he has to uh, ask few questions and he has to give some assignment to the uh, students so these uh, three phases uh, must be included in every lesson students participate actively in those activities which they find very much interesting and stimulating so plan interesting and challenging learning experiences next is plan for meaningful learning students benefit from the planning of instruction that allows them to see the relationship between classroom learning and problem solving in everyday life so there must be some relevance there must be correspondence between what these teacher is telling with what they have experienced in their daily life so that will help them to transfer classroom learning in a new situation so, and that will also help the teacher to promote meaningful learning the next is students benefit from planned assessment that contain both easy and difficult material graded to student abilities so as a teacher uh, we have to plan for uh, various type, uh, kinds of uh, assignments uh, while preparing a lecture plan organize a regular assessment schedule students <laughs> benefit from planning of instruction which allow the students to have continuous monitoring so uh, organize a regular assessment schedule that is after explaining one component you ask one or two questions then go to the second component explain and again one or two questions can be asked and at the end of the lecture you can ask the questions pertaining to the entire chapter so organize a regular assessment schedule another is the teacher has to be flexible he must be ready to adapt or alter his plans in the case of unanticipated event such as power failure suppose I am developing my lecture and power goes off or sometimes the technology also fails uh, the pen drive or the CD doesn't work so in that case the teacher has to be resourceful enough to admit okay no problem I will develop my lecture with the help of chalkboard only so uh, there could be unforeseen interruptions there could be uh, that some students uh, experience difficulty with a particular content matter so he has to make certain changes so he has to be flexible and he has to be ready to adapt the plans now let us 
learn events of instruction. What are these events of instruction? In making progress from one moment to next in a class, certain events take place, which acts upon the students and in, in which student becomes involved. Or in other words, we can say that events of instructions are designed to make it possible for the learner to proceed lessons objective. Now, the question is where and when these uh, instructional events can be utilized. First of all, we will have a look at these nine events of instruction. The first is gaining attention. The purpose is to alert the student to the reception of the stimuli. And in general, attention can be gained by introduction of rapid stimulus change. Now, there are many uh, components of uh, this uh, skill of stimulus variation. One is that normally teachers stand stationary at one point, say uh, uh, at the lecture stand, uh, stand. And some students are looking at me from a particular angle, some students are looking from another kind of angle. Since there is no change in my posture, naturally there will be no change in their posture. So they will tolerate me for some time, after that they will experience some fatigue. So the tip is, purposeful movements, that is instead of standing stationary, bring purposeful movement. You can go slowly and slowly uh, to the uh, near to the student and sometimes you can go to this side and sometimes slow, slowly, slowly you can move to this side. So purposeful movement. Many teachers, they uh, put their hands in the pocket while making a presentation. Some teachers stand like this, some teachers stand like this, some teachers they always keep hand uh, on the table or some teachers what they do, they will break down the chalk into two pieces and then they will start playing. So suppose I am standing like this and I say in front of my house there is a big house. Now I repeat this sentence again. In front of my house there is a big house. So the second is meaningful gestures. Third is change of voice. Do not speak in a monotonous voice. So bring variation in the pitch tone of your voice. Uh, you want to highlight some sentence, you can speak it loudly. You can uh, uh, decrease your rate of delivery or you can increase your rate of delivery. Okay, This is change of voice. Another is pausing. When I say these are due to laws of inertia. So between due to and laws of inertia, you pause a little. So that will help the students to gain their attention. So pausing. Another is change in interactional patterns. Interaction is two way. So in between you can insert few question, you can invite few question, now they will participate. So uh, uh, only you are not explaining, they are also participating. So change in interaction pattern. Another is oral, visual, Switching. Oral involves sense of hearing, visual involves sense of sight. So switch over from one mode to another mode. That is, uh, you are making a presentation, go to board and write something or you can show some slide uh, through the PPT. So uh, various, uh, uh, you can say, sense organs can be utilized by the students and that will help them to uh, focus on uh, your topic. And another very important is,
maintain eye contact with each and every student sitting in the classroom. So always uh, give your glance to all the students sitting in the classroom for a fraction of seconds. So these are some of the tips for which the attention can be uh, gained. So this is one and this can be carried out throughout the lecture. Informing students about objectives of instruction. When you enter the class, students want to know why they are sitting in the classroom. So after giving them a reason for learning, inform them about the objective of your presentation. For example, uh, in the beginning, I informed you that in this session, we will learn or we will understand the planning and delivery of effective instruction. And after this session is over, you will be able to explain the concept of instructional planning. You will be able to explain the advantages of preparing a plan or you will be able to focus on determining what to teach and planning how to teach and so on. So these instruction objectives must be written in form of small bullets uh, on the chalkboard or maybe also written on the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, you will find that it is very interesting for the student. They also note down in their notebooks. Ensuring prerequisites of learners. That is what they already know. Never proceed uh, by ignoring what they already know. So you need to evaluate the prerequisites of your student. For example, I take one topic. What is the position of this chalk? The obvious answer is that it is at rest. And suppose I switch on the fan and answer the question, what is the position of fan? Definitely you will say that it is in motion. Now this is at rest. How can I bring it into motion? The reply is that by pushing or by pulling, that is by applying force, we can bring this chalk into motion. Suppose you are sitting in a moving bus and the driver suddenly applies brakes. What happens? We fall forward. And what happens when the driver suddenly starts the bus? We go backward. Why are these due to? This is my last question. So now these students are quite motivated to learn why this is happening. Then you can say that these are due to laws of inertia. So today in this session, we will learn laws of inertia. Now you see, I have explained the concept of rest, concept of motion and concept of force two days back. Now I want to know whether they have sufficient background about the concept of uh, rest, motion and knowledge, uh, force, etc. or not. So you need to ensure the prerequisites of learner. And one more thing you must have noticed that I have never said that I am going to talk to you about this thing. Yet today I will teach this thing because when I say I am going to talk to you about inertia, probably you would say that, sir, this is your headache. Please go and break your head. Okay. Now I have to arouse the curiosity of the students. I have to uh, tell them about the necessity of learning a new topic. So after creating the necessity, the teacher must say that today in this session, we will learn because in today's context, the students are also possessing some amount of knowledge and students are also contributing. So never say today I will teach, today I will discuss, today I am going to talk to you about this thing. So this is uh, we have to uh, keep in mind. The next event of instruction is presenting the stimulus material and bring variation in the presentation of stimulus material. Stimulus material means your lecture content, your way of asking question, your way of, uh, you can say, uh, explaining the concepts, principles and skill and so on. So you have to bring variation. Providing learning guidance. This is used when you are giving some question or you are giving some assignment. Suppose you are asking some question and student is not able to answer the question. So you may provide some hint, okay? You may provide him some supportive, uh, you can say, uh, clue. So that will help him to come to the right answer. So providing learning guidance. Next event is asking him to show, asking him to do it. Or you are, say, writing the steps on the chalkboard. 
you can invite one of the students to write the next step on the chalkboard. So that is eliciting the performance. After he has shown the performance or after he has given the answer, the teacher's role is to provide informative feedback about performance correctness. Okay, your answer is uh, uh, correct. You are wonderful. Uh, you have given partial answer. So you have to give informative feedback. Assessing student performance. So this can be on a continuous mode like uh, after covering one part you can ask a few questions and at the end of the topic you can give some assignment or you can ask few questions. And the last but not the least is enhancing retention and transfer. And this is possible when you give the students some assignment by which the students will be able to apply classroom learning in a new situation. So that will help the students retain the information for a longer period of time and that will also help them transfer the classroom knowledge in a new situation. So these are nine events of instruction which need to be put into practice while making a presentation. Now let us uh, have a look at the format of a lesson plan. Uh, how the lesson plan will look like. The topic can be written on the top. Name of the teacher. Subject. The class. The place that is room number, etc. and the date on which it is to be taken. So this is the preliminary information every lesson plan must contain. Then we move to the second uh, aspect of lesson plan. Uh, we will define the instruction objective. Instruction objectives can be written in three ways. One is general objective. For example, the topic is Ohm's law and how it can be converted into general objective. After the topic is over, students will be able to understand Ohm's law. This is general objective. Then what are the specific objective? They will be able to define current, voltage, resistance. They will be able to state SI unit of current, voltage, resistance. They will be able to set apparatus as per the diagram. They will be able to verify Ohm's law. They will be able to uh, draw graph between V and I and they will be able to list situations where Ohm's law can be applicable. So these are the specific objective which lead to the attainment of general objective that is understand Ohm's law. Now there is another category of objective. Uh, we name uh, uh, them as readiness objectives. You see in learning any topic certain prerequisites are required. These prerequisites are nothing but the capabilities the students already acquired prior to instruction which indicates their readiness to learn new thing. Now in this topic of Ohm's law, we suppose that students have already learned the concept of current and voltage. So what could be the readiness objective? Readiness objective could be that he can define current, he can uh, define voltage, he can state as a unit of current, he can state as a unit of voltage and so on. So whatever you have co covered already and if that is relevant that you need to ensure that they possess the previous knowledge. Now the three phases can be written uh, in a, a tabular form. In the first column phase, objective, instructional activities, media and how much time you require for developing that particular objective. So the first phase is introduction. So this may include any one of these three. Uh, I have written describe activities that explain the relevance of learning the content of lesson and what is to be learned in the lesson. Second list activities that may arouse curiosity of learning the content and third could be write activities that will present the prerequisites in the students. And if you require any media, you can give a reference of that media in the column media and how much time you require for developing introduction, you can give uh, some time for the lecture introduction. Then the another phase is the development phase. So you can state the objective one specific objective. Then in, under instruction activity, you may write describe the strategy of presenting the information 
in respect of the first objective to be achieved or then you can also include the activities for assessing the achievement of objectives then under the media column you may write that a powerpoint or you can write a figure showing or a chart showing the material you require you can write and how much time you require you can also mention then likewise you can uh, uh, do for this uh, second objective third objective and so on and the last phase is the closure phase and here you can list the activities for summarizing evaluation of the lessons objective and follow up what media you require how much time you require and the timing column gives an indication of the pacing of the lesson so once you have presented the lecture in the classroom, you can make certain changes on the basis of your today's lecture. Now we will move to the second part of our presentation, instructional delivery. And uh, as I told you in the beginning, that every presentation must contain three phases. One is the introductory phase. Uh, introduction is uh, like the warm-up phase of your session. So it should fire the imagination of your student. The purpose is to arouse curiosity, to purpose is to create their interest, to purpose is to gain their attention. So uh, after gaining attention, you state the instruction objectives clearly and you can use advanced organizers to bridge a gap between what the student already knows and what he needs to know. I can give one more example. I can ask, I'm not going to uh, tell you about the topic right now. First of all, I need to generate the interest. What are the constituents of air? The probable answer could be oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and so on. My question is, which gas do we inhale? Oxygen. Which gas is available in soda water bottle? Carbon dioxide gas. Which gas is used to extinguish fire? Again, carbon dioxide gas. So you see, you have seen number of applications of carbon dioxide gas how this gas can be prepared now students are quite motivated to learn about the preparation of carbon dioxide gas now this is the right time to announce the topic today in this session we will learn the preparation of carbon dioxide gas and in this session first of all we will learn the contents required for preparation of carbon dioxide you go to board and write all these things content required then the precautions to be observed for preparation of carbon dioxide gas or the procedure of making carbon dioxide gas, the physical properties, the chemical properties, advantages and disadvantages, etc. So it means you should not start wrongly. Always give them a reason. Never start with a, talk, uh, with a sentence, I am going to talk to you about this thing. Because uh, if I say today I am going to talk to you about inertia, and a, uh, a student of class 7 has not heard this word inertia. So he will not, uh, he, uh, it will frighten him. Okay. So you need to begin what he already knows. The second phase is the development phase. And we must include two basic activities. One is explanation, which is nothing but a comprehensive exposition that increases students understanding of subject matter. So explanation can be used to uh, present the concept, to present the uh, principle or to uh, use uh, problem solving. And the second very important is the demonstration. Demonstration actually means to show something. But in teaching polytechnics and engineering colleges, it means much more than mere showing. It means showing how something is to be done or not to be done. Or in other words, we can say that a demonstration is a link between theory and practice. Demonstration involves a verbal explanation coupled with live display using operators for explaining concepts, principles and skills. So demonstration is a physical display of the form, outline or substance of objects or events for the purpose of increasing knowledge and understanding of those objects or events. Another very important component is questioning and questioning serves various purposes like facilitate communication. You can 
involve their participation through questioning you can insert few question you can invite few question questioning helps you focus attention on particular aspects of topic questioning evaluates students knowledge of knowledge and understanding of subject matter questioning also helps the teacher to stimulate student thinking or questioning also helps the teacher to control social behavior of student that is when they are not taking interest the teacher may ask few question or to gain their attention now the uh, very important aspect is that is what question to ask very important make sure that the questions are relevant to instructional objectives you have al already defined instructional objectives so your questions must focus on those instructional objectives and questions should be of varying levels of difficulty matching to various or uh, matching to a uh, range of students abilities so you can ask uh, a very simple question uh, to a very uh, you can say below average student slightly uh, difficult to a average student and very difficult uh, to a gifted student and when uh, you are asking question always use a language in which your students can understand so use familiar vocabulary for framing question this is about what question to ask then second is how to ask question again a very important aspect of questioning ask questions one at a time don't ask two three question in one go this will confuse the student and ask questions in a particular order from easy to difficult that is in a particular sequence uh, the question can be asked don't favor few students at the expense of other so always first of all address the uh, question to all the students give them some time to think about the answer then you can call upon a particular student to respond the answer the third one is how to respond to students answer again very important part of uh, presentation after you receive students response if the response is correct you can say wonderful you are very right you have said very uh, rightly that and then you can uh, link the uh, answer with this particular statement uh, another thing which we have to keep in mind is that if the student is not able to answer properly or he is giving a wrong answer it means he has not understood the question so you can analyze that is you can divide that question into small small question our purpose is to take him to the right answer not to snub him or not to prove that he cannot answer uh, answer the questions another very uh, important aspect of development phase is assigning work task so assignment can be given uh, uh, during the class and they are also asked to uh, complete assignment after the session is over so always make sure that the assignments are meaningful directly related to the instruction objectives and you can also give supportive hints if required uh, in some uh, difficult exercises very important question the teacher usually asked what can we do to motivate students to learn the question is very simple yet the answer is not straight forward because the typical procedures that the teachers employ for motivating the students are very often indirect and subtle so what is motivation motivation is actually concerned with why of behavior the reason behind people putting in effort it is the process which leads the individual to attempt to satisfy some need okay so motivation refers to motives in action what is motive something that makes a person act in a particular way you see uh, there are some students who aim for personal satisfaction from reading a book or who have inherent desire to learn about a science topic such students are intrinsically motivated so intrinsic motivation can be conceived as a state 
which forces the individual to learn something or to acquire something for his own personal satisfaction. So this is one kind of motivation that is intrinsic motivation. Second is extrinsic motivation. Uh, like some students who study to gain good grades or who study to gain the attention of teachers are extrinsically motivation, motivated. So extrinsic motivation can be conceived as a state in which the student doesn't learn of his own accord but under the influence of some external motivator. For example, at home, the father says, if you get all A's, you will get 100 rupees. So that 100 rupees will act as an external motivator. It is not inherent in the behavior. It is something which is administered by some external agent. So in the classroom, what the teacher can provide external uh, motivator, he can say very good, you have said very rightly, or he, uh, or he can give him star and so on, or he can share his books, or he can give his uh, uh, spare time to him, and so many uh, techniques can be used. Here I would like to explain the reinforcement theory, which is based upon law of effect, which states that behavior which is accompanied by satisfaction or reward on the part of individual is likely to be repeated or permanent than the behavior which is accompanied by dissatisfaction or failure on the part of individual. So if uh, uh, the uh, students are given enough uh, motivation that reinforce him to respond in the future. Uh, the stimulus response and reinforcement, these are the three components of behavior modification. What is a stimulus? Stimulus could be anything. Object, it could be event, it could be person that leads to a response. Okay. And what is the response? Response is a unit of behavior that follows the stimulus. And what is reinforcement? Reinforcement is a consequence of the response. Now let me apply. A stimulus response pair, if it is accompanied by a desirable consequence, then it will be more likely that the stimulus involved will prompt the same response in future. So if you want to reinforce him, you have to provide some motivation. Okay? And then there are many techniques of motivating students, like uh, uh, you can set SMART goals. SMART refers to S means specific. M stands for measure, measurable, A stands for attainable, R stands for relevant, and T stands for time bound. Use a variety of learning methods, use a, a reinforcement technique, a provide immediate feedback, and there are so many methods which can be employed for motivating the students. The third phase is the consolidation phase, and this requires the teacher to summarize what he has covered in the lecture. So that I will do at the end. So summarization. During summarization, the teacher role is to assess the student performance. And by assessment, we mean those activities which are designed to measure student achievement brought about as a result of some unit of instruction. And performance objective is the keystone in planning for evaluation procedure. That is, performance assessed during presentation must be the same performance that is described in the instructional objective. And when you are planning for assessment and evaluation, you need to keep in mind two very important aspects of uh, evaluation. That is the reliability and the validity. Reliability refers to consistency of results from one measurement to another measurement and validity refers to appropriateness of test results. That is, a test is valid if it measures what it is supposed to measure. Suppose uh, a test is meant to measure student's ability to define force, then the question should be stated as define force and not what is force and not what do you know about force because these two later questions, that is what is force and what do you know about force may be measuring something different. But our objective 
uh, initially was that he will be able to define force. So our question should be define force. So that will provide valid results. So adopt assessment practices meeting the guidelines for defining instructional objectives, selecting teaching methods and media, monitoring student progress and diagnosing learning difficulties. And variety of test items must be used while evaluating student performance because each type of test has its own advantages and limitations. So it will be incorrect to select only a single type of testing for measuring students attainment of objective. And tests can be classified into two categories depending upon how you expect your students to respond to those items. Your students could either supply an answer to a question by a word, by number, by few sentences, or your student could select an appropriate response from a set of responses supplied along with the question. So obviously there are two types of tests, supply type test and selection type test. So the supply type test requires the student to supply an answer to a question by a word. When I say name one sulfide ore of copper, so he is giving the answer by a word. When I say uh, 8 is what percentage of 64s, it means he is supplying the answer by a number. Okay. When I say define force, he is supplying the answer by two sentences. And there could be more sentences like explain the working principle of carburetor of an IC engine. So in this case, he is elaborating. So these are uh, supply type uh, item and there are selection type item like multiple choice, alternate re response and matching type. So students must be given variety of test item to measure various aspects of his ability or his performance. Consolidation phase also includes providing feedback and correctives. Feedback is the information which is fed back to individuals about the appropriateness of their actions or responses. It means after the student gives the response, the teacher has to provide feedback or once the student submits his assignment, teacher has to give his remarks on the assignments of each and every student and those assignments must be returned in time. And second is correctives, instructional procedures intended to rectify errors in responding or inadequacies in learning. So teachers have to provide various corrective measures and this can be done if he, he obtains a reliable assessment of students task performance before giving feedback and uh, correctives. And the timing component is very important in giving the feedback and correctives. So we have to keep in mind. And before we conclude, uh, in this session, we have learned the concept of instructional planning. Instructional planning means plan of actions of what a teacher has to do in the classroom. And we have focused on what to teach and planning how to teach. And at the end, we have covered the three phases uh, during the instruction delivery, how to explain, how to demonstrate, how to ask question, what kind of assignment should be given and the motivation or uh, reinforcement component during the uh, development phases. Thank you very much. the university next session on two o'clock next session two o'clock please sir sir up for station when we come then we will ask questions first we will ask questions how do you get it? sir we have to get it you can take it from the time when the last time was a little bit ठीक है। आज क्या है? लास्ट में जो सामान
ये तो वहां से आएंगे ना लुधियाना से नहीं नहीं है है दो बजे आप दो बजे अभी चल